folks, it's time for another look at TI history. Since today I'll be talking about the golden age of the TI-99, which is kind of a follow-up to a video I did a while back where, in that case, I looked at the first wave of TI titles from 1979 through to 1981. With this one looking at the first full year of the TI-99 foray after that, where the TI home computer really took on its final form and where the TI software library fleshed itself out in a big way. But to be fair to what came before that, TI's library at the end of 81 already included some important fan favorites, like Tombstone City, where you fight aliens in the Old West, and Hunt the Wumpus, where you make your way through deadly caves trying not to get eaten by a hungry monster, and Car Wars, where you dodge opposing traffic and try to cover the whole track before you crash. Then, best of all, at the end of 81, TI Invaders, which set a new standard by delivering a game experience that improved in big ways over the arcade version it borrowed its design from. Those early in-house TI games, which were there for the release of the TI-99 4A, were hugely important, of course. They gave the new wave of TI-99 4A owners good entertainment options right off the bat. And people kept on enjoying most of them through the system's whole run. But moving into 1982, TI's next contributions made an even bigger splash. And it's this year that gave us the games you'll hear about most when people talk about the TI-99 game library today. Still, the system needed more than just a few new games going into 1982 if it was going to compete as a top home computer. And one thing 99ers really needed in 1982 was better tools for making TI game development happen. TI did all its own in-house development on TI mini computers, and up to this point, any outside cart developer had to use those too. Plus, as far as out-of-the-box options go, the system's built-in basic was so weird and different from anything else on the market that by 1981, there was not much worth playing that was written both for and on a TI-99. Anyway, my point being, 1982 had a lot of catching up to do, which is why it's so important that the 99 4A's first full year on the market did in fact give the system what it needed, as far as development tools go. Right away in January of 1982 at Winter CES, TI was making a lot of promises. And backing up those promises, on display at CES was the TI Peripheral Expansion Box, which could bring expansion RAM and disk drives to the average TI-99 user. While on display at CES in the software sphere was TI Logo, with its great sprite graphics and turtle graphics. Then, likewise making an appearance that January was the P-System, which let you write programs and run programs with sprites and sound and speech written in UCSD Pascal. And if that wasn't enough, there was the Mini Memory Package, which would let you write and run assembly programs even on a TI-99 with nothing but a tape deck for expansion. A solution for the masses. Plus, for the power users, there was Editor Assembler, which would let you write and assemble machine language programs in a full-fledged screen editor. And TI showed off how powerful those tools could be right off the bat, with Mini Memory's Lines demo being the first software for the TI-99 4A that showed off how assembly software could use the system's bitmap mode giving you eight times the color resolution of the 99.4. And while we got even more impressive demos of what bitmap mode could do in years to come, Lines was a pretty good start, which was all the more impressive for its being able to run on an unexpanded TI-99 with nothing but a cassette deck. Then, otherwise showing off what assembly software could do at that winter CES in January of 82, was the disc prototype of Munchman, which ended up being TI's hottest game release of the season, giving 99ers a great Pac-Man clone, 
and one which could stand alongside TI Invaders as proof that the TI-99 was a system for top-tier arcade action. With Munchman being the most played game for a lot of 99ers through to the end of the system's run. And if all that weren't enough, another announcement that made January 82 a big month for the TI-99 was the announcement that the system would get 11 more Scott Adams adventures, with those joining the Adventure Cart's original pack-in adventure, Pirate Adventure. Like Pirate Adventure, those adventures were available on both cassette and disc, and they included Adventureland, Mission Impossible, Voodoo Castle, The Count, Strange Odyssey, Mystery Funhouse, Pyramid of Doom, Ghost Town, Savage Island 1 and 2, and The Golden Voyage. So the mileage the adventure cart delivered in the end was pretty crazy. Now something you'll probably notice about those adventures is that they've got a variety of manual styles, which might seem odd for games that all came out about the same time, but the reason for that being 1982 also saw a total revamp of TI's cart and manual designs. At the start of the year, all manuals were still using their classic iconographic art, and all carts were still using black labels, and by the end of the year, all manuals were now using more detailed and colorful art, and all carts were using colored labels. The upshot being that any software from the start of the year got releases in both styles, while any software from the end of the year only ever got a modern style release. At any rate, January was a great start to the year for the TI-99, with a lot of big promises coming out of TI. And yet, there are caveats as far as how this actually played out goes. The big one being TI's production and distribution network, which sucked. Meaning shipments of these new tools and toys mostly did not happen on schedule. In its July 82 newsletter, the International User Group ran a story titled Peripheral Expansion System Will Not Meet Second Quarter Release, explaining that limited supply was expected in July, but real supply would probably show up in August, September, or even later than that. What's worse, Mini Memory and Editor Assembler were affected too. So, in that same issue, you'll find a piece entitled Mini Memory Delay, which talks about dealers failing to get shipments on time or in quantity. So, the third-party assembly software the TI-99 eventually got was not right around the corner as of January 82. But as hard as waiting was, most people did get their hands on TI's new development tools by the end of the year. And in the meantime, a different wave of new development was starting to take hold. With software like Wizards Dominion from American Software Design and Distribution taking advantage of the new extended basic command module. Wizards Dominion being arguably the first graphical dungeon crawl RPG for the TI-99, where you build a character and explore the dungeon and fight the ogre who lives inside. Then search for the magic chamber and its treasure, even featuring a dungeon map to help you with your quest. Now to be clear on timing here, when TI first printed the words TI Extended Basic Command Module now being offered in their user newsletter, that was May of 1981, not 1982, and the same goes for 99er Magazine's first review of the cart in their own May 1981 issue. And yet, in late 1982, you had 99ers Greg Keane writing about the glorious moment that summer of 82 when he'd finally found a single extended basic display copy at his local Toys R Us. So, yeah, distribution was rough. The same way it was for Editor Assembler, which 99er took its first look at in September of 1981. But the good news for 1982 was Extended Basic got the ball rolling earlier than EA did by far, and so by mid-1982, when Greg Keane finally got his cart, 
companies like Moonbeam were already shipping extended basic software to customers. As you might expect, though, the first XP games were a long way from the best we'd ever see. And in the earliest XP games of 82, most of them, like Moonbeam's Death Drones here, still rely on what's really a TI Basic style design, with a few XP bells and whistles thrown in. But even those first games, with Moonvasion here being another one of those, are better off for just how much faster Extended Basic is, even when it's running essentially the same code as you'd find in a typical TI Basic game. And as time went on, later games like Astromania show off more of what Extended Basic sprite support can do, which TI Basic never could. Strike Force 99 being another nice 1982 effort from Moonbeam Software that's very recognizably not just a TI Basic game anymore, but something way beyond what Console Basic could do before. And of course, these are no match for the extended Basic games we'd get later on into the mid-80s, like Billy Ball to the rescue here since, just like the community learned an awful lot about optimizing TI Console Basic, it learned a lot about how to make Extended Basic really shine as time went on. But Moonbeam's 1982 library, including their space exploration game, Moonbeam Express, are pretty good for their short turnaround. And, as more time passed, Moonbeam's XP games got even better, with 1983's Cavern Quest being a nice example of what was just around the corner. Though Moonbeam wasn't alone on the 1982 XP games market, and Futura was another developer adding to the year's XP offerings, with their 1982 London Blitz being one title that I think is pretty clever about taking advantage of the power of sprites in XP, where the goal is to spot bombers that enter the range of your roving spotlights, and then time your anti-aircraft fire to take them out. It's a simple game, but it's well designed around what XP can do, which is what I like to see. But nice as all that is, command module cartridges had always been the heart of the TI library, and they mostly stayed that way in 1982. With Munchman having been a great start when its cart released in March, then with Tunnels of Doom making just as big a mark one month later, with its April release. Which instantly made TOD the definitive TI RPG for 1982 and for the rest of the TI-99's lifetime, with two RPG adventures included on disc or cassette. Those being, first off, Pennies and Prizes, which is a simple dungeon treasure hunt, and second, Quest of the King, which is the real RPG dungeon crawl everyone associates with the game. Like we saw with the adventure cart, though, Tunnels of Doom wasn't just an opportunity to play the pack in adventures. In the long run, it was an opportunity to play all new adventures in the same game engine. And with the right software, you could even build your own adventures with new enemies and new heroes and new graphics. That gave us heavy reworks like Halls of Lost Moria, a game that goes with a Tolkien theme, which styles its dungeon graphics nicely to fit that backstory. And elsewhere, it gave us Computer Quest, where, according to the game story, the world has run out of TI computers, and you have to retrieve a lost TI-99 prototype and peripheral expansion box. So Munchman had started the year with a really big addition to the game library that would be an instant TI classic, and Tunnels of Doom had rounded out that first half of 1982 with another all-time great. But Summer CES was right around the corner, and there were a pile of new announcements and product demos coming up there. The most important of those, without a doubt, being Parsec, 
the third in this holy trinity of 1982 releases, and the space action combat game that became the most iconic TI game of all time when all was said and done, for a whole host of reasons. It features TI synthesized speech, which is used during gameplay, and which doesn't interrupt gameplay to generate speech. It features good enemy variety with different movement patterns and attacks for each of its enemy types. Then, above and beyond those enemies, you've got the dangers of its asteroid belts and refueling tunnels. Plus, it was the first TI-99 game to use the 99 Foray's new bitmap mode. Though, as I'd pointed out earlier, not the first software to show off bitmap mode, since Mini Memory came out just a bit earlier with its Lines demo. An interesting upshot of Parsec using bitmap mode being that it simply doesn't work at all on the 99.4. Insert the cart and try to start a game, and nothing will happen because the 9918 video processor in that system doesn't support the mode. But on the 994A, smooth scrolling bitmap backgrounds abound. And while Parsec was a hard act to follow, Summer CES also had TI's Chisholm Trail cart making its debut, which challenges you to drive your cattle to market along the Chisholm Trail, where perils along the way include cattle wrestlers and wranglers. It's an oddly forgotten game as far as TI carts go, because, well, right in the wake of Munchman, Tunnels of Doom, and Parsec, it was just too easy to get lost in the shuffle. And while this game wasn't a misfire exactly, it does look a little weak next to the biggest three releases in TI history. Games aside, though, Summer CES still had more big news, with TI Writer as the TI-99's native word processor getting an introduction. And, maybe more importantly, the TI edition of Microsoft Multiplan getting attention too. Which I call more important because, well, this is the golden age of the spreadsheet after all, and Multiplan was, in its very brief time, a real contender. So, adding it to the TI library was a big bonus. Otherwise, Summer CES saw Logo 2 get a fourth quarter release announcement, which was a great addition to the library, not just for the upgrades it made to TI Logo, but also for its being a mainstream consumer product right off the bat, where the original TI Logo was initially sold only to schools. So combine Logo being on the mass market and Logo getting an upgrade, and you've got one more great development tool for 99ers to work with from 1982 on. When all was said and done, Parsec was the star of the show at Summer CES, and the star of the 1982 library as a whole, with scrolling backgrounds and fast responsive action, and seamless in-game voice synth. <laughs> But one more 1982 game title did show what TI Voice Synth could do for a TI-99 action game, and that was Alpiner. TI didn't have it ready to show at Summer CES, but even without much promotion, it ended up being another hot release for TI. It debuted in late 82 as the last big release of the year, and it featured some of the best voice synth you'll hear on the TI-99. With two different voices doing the narration, Aubrey Anderson and Cliff Eastome. Press any key to go on. Here we go again. The screen updates here are a bit chunky, given that, like Tunnels of Doom, this is a GPL game, which is to say a game written for the proprietary virtual machine stored in TI-99 ROM. And GPL is always going to be slower than native machine code. But it makes up for slow animation with massive sprites and simple but fun gameplay. Yes, it's a crazy climber clone, but it adds a lot with the mountaineering theme where you climb Hood, Matterhorn, Kenya, McKinley, Garmo, and Everest if you dare. With that last being a real challenge, as it should be. So, all in all, 1982 is a heck of a time for TI Tech. 
not just for games, but for the software you could use to make games for the TI-99. With Logo, Pascal, Extended Basic, and Assembly software development, all on the market by the end of the year. And with Extended Basic titles being one way those tools were already showing their worth in 1982. But it's the big cart releases of the year that people remember most today, of course with Munchman as the definitive Pac-Man clone for the system, always surpassing the popularity of Atarisoft's Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man carts, even once those came out. And Tunnels of Doom as the system's top dungeon crawler, whose library of adventures continued to grow long after the system's heyday. And of course, Parsec as the definitive scrolling shooter for the TI-99 and arguably the definitive TI game, period, in its own time or any time since. With only Tunnels of Doom and Hunt the Wumpus being the other serious contenders for that, I'd say. There's plenty more worth talking about that happened in 1983 and beyond, of course. But I won't be getting to all that just yet. So for now, thanks for watching, folks, and, well, hopefully I'll see you again soon either to talk about what happened next or to take on whatever other TI subject happens to take my fancy.